Hello, I'm Dr. Neeti Gupta, pediatric endocrinologist and digital wellness coach in Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome to Inspinar. Her 2015 TED Talk, Olympic Level Compassion, in which she revealed that her 2012 Olympic silver medal winning ride with Team USA was powered by plants, inspired many to adopt a plant-based diet. Dotsi, welcome to Inspinar. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. Thank you for being here. So Dotsi, your transformation from being a fashion model in New York to almost dying of anorexia, to winning an Olympic medal, to forcing people to rethink how they eat. The whole transformation is nothing short of a Hollywood blockbuster script. Share with us, how did everything unfold for you? Oh my heavens. Well, I am I am almost finished writing the book, so. <laughs> there you go, that's the script. Who wants to dive in really deep? Um, Oh gosh, just like so many of us, I had um, a lot of fear and anxiety and frustration and doubt. There so many doubts about myself in my um, late teens, early twenties. You know, I was in the middle of um, college at Villanova in in uh, Philadelphia, and I mean, gosh, I you know, I, I don't really know what the mechanism is specifically that. Um, jolted me into starving myself, starting to starve myself. Um, but I think if, you know, and I have certainly taken a deep dive and, and certainly with my therapist, as I went through my healing journey, I was afraid that I wasn't going to do anything or become anything. And I felt so out of control of being able to create something, create a life that um, I thought mattered. And controlling my food became the passion when I couldn't figure out how to make something of my life. I didn't know how I was going to make some of my life. And I, almost every early 20 human being on the earth can relate to some, to some degree, right? You're just in this, you know, so not, of course, right? Like they've decided what they're going to do when they're six and they just straight head for it. But um, I didn't know I was studying journalism and I liked it, but I didn't love it. Uh, and I just didn't know what I was going to do. And so it, it started slowly, the, the control of um, controlling my food intake. And it just allowed me to grasp onto something that I could do and I could do well and I could win at. And, and, and that's really, I guess, at the, 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 the core of my personality, I'm the competitor and then, you know, whatever, 15, 16 years later, after I healed I, on the Olympic podium, and I think I didn't realize how competitive I was and how competitive I was and am with myself. I've always been very competitive with myself, not so much with the competitors as a lot of athletes are. So it just grew 17 nasty heads as I kept going, right? It got just got worse and worse and worse to where I was 98 pound suicidal just very sick and didn't want to let go of that control. So in and out of treatment centers, in and out of working with therapists, just not never, you know, never really ready those couple of years when I was, you know, really sick, but in and out of treatment, I just wasn't ready to do it. I wasn't ready to heal. I wasn't ready to get, get well. I was too in love with the competition and the control that I had over food. And then what, how did that lead into cycling? Well, um, right. Yes, that's a that's a bit of a bit of a jump. You know, it's it's really kind of a funny story because I I had been competitive as a as a as a younger 
child horseback riding. I grew up in Kentucky and grew up competitively saddlebred horseback riding. Although I would argue that the athlete is the horse, not, not so much the rider, <laughs> but I didn't grow up competing. And I knew that I love that, but I had, you know, really hadn't found anything after that, that, um, that I was good at, I guess, really, as, as far as this, as a sport was, was to go. Um, Although I, I always loved moving my body and exercising. And then, and then of course, as, as the anorexia kept rearing its ugly head throughout my early twenties, I, you know, picked up the, the bad habit of the over-exercise part of that disorder, you know, so it was hours in the gym on the Stairmaster and the treadmill and the elliptical and all those awful pieces of machinery. Um, and so when I finally started on my healing journey and I'm going to say it finally started because I I recognized I had just had a second unsuccessful suicide attempt and shortly thereafter I realized that I wanted to try and get better not for myself but for my family because they were just terrified they'd been terrified for about five years at that point and trying so hard to reach me and I just thought you know what I'm just going to try I, I I know I'm not going to be successful and it's not really for me but I owe it to them to try that's really was that 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 seed that was set. And and so I I found a therapist and we started working. And fast forward about two, two and a half years later, towards the end of my healing journey, I was so much better. I was integrated back into life. I'd gained weight, I'd gotten a job, I was I had friends, like I was living again. And she said, you know, Dotsie, and she hadn't mentioned this for two and a half years, but she said, I remember when we first sat down and you said, Chris, I'm not going to consider myself a hundred percent well until I can eat any food on planet earth. Like I don't want to have any rules around food and I want to be able to move my body in a healthy way again. Like I, you know, not in the gym doing eight hours on the elliptical. I want to be able to be outside. I want to, I don't care what the movement is or what a sport, what the sport is, but I just want to be able to do that. I said, oh yeah, now I remember telling you that. And she said, so I want you to pick a, um, like a sport or an exercise or whatever it might be. I just want you to pick something and I want you to start doing it. Right. And I want, I, I, we're going to work through this and see, and see how you go. And I thought just out of the blue, I just said, you know what, what if I get a bike? Because I just love the weather. I had just moved out to Los Angeles. Well, like a couple of years before that, um, but I had grew up on the East coast of, and you know, like I said, with the school in Philly. So it was, it was January and it was 75 degrees. <laughs> no, I was like, I can do this year round. And it's such an epic ride up Pacific Coast Highway and into the mountains, right? Yes. So I thought, I just thought, I was trying to find, think of something that would make me feel the most free. And right on the bike, you can go a lot more miles than you can on foot, right? You can travel. Yes. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I could bike 50 miles or whatever and, and just and just see all this magnificence and feel the wind in my face and breathe the fresh air and I'm I'm getting better and I'm doing life again. And I was just, there was a lot of joy happening. And so- I got a bike, quite literally. At, from that point, it was 14 years later that was the Olympic podium. But there were there were no Olympic dreams, even in, you know, in the farthest you know depths of my imagination at that point when I got the bike. So basically, your competition with yourself over time, over the course of almost two decades, evolved into competition with the meat and dairy industry. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? So now you don't compete yeah. with yourself, but you compete with the way people eat. So tell us more about that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I so I I I did that TED talk. Well, I did that TED talk at the Olympics, but I I just uncovered, which anybody can uncover if you so choose, what goes on behind closed doors um, in our food system, and the misery and the torture and the killing of billions and billions of animals every year. Animals that are just as smart as the dogs that we pet and put on a pedestal and love so much. And I grew up loving animals. And so when I uncovered what was going on behind my plate that I was partaking in three times a day, because I was, a, I mean, I grew up a meat eater. I, I mean, I grew up on brisket and barbecue and you know macaroni and cheese and coleslaw and everything in the South. I just had this soul shift and I just, it was one of those moments that we all have in our life at some point where we just are really convicted with something. And I just thought that is not something I'm going to pay into anymore. That is, and at that point I was like, and I'm going to fight against it for the rest of my life. But I was just like, and so 
two, this was about two years before Olympics. So this is about 2010. And I just took animal foods out of my diet and put more plant foods in. And because of the history of my anorexia, I actually was very knowledgeable about nutrition and calories and micronutrients and macronutrients because I counted everything. So that became not before it was a sword, but now it became a blessing that I knew so much because I I was already aware how much protein were in different plants. And I was already aware that I could switch out my meat, my eggs, um, you know, for tempeh and tofu scramble. Like I knew that. Uh, and I always had loved, I mean, it wasn't like a secret that fruits and vegetables are extraordinarily healthy for us, right? So it's right. like that, that, that we, we know that. And so I just started making my plate look differently. And my, you know, at the training center, the U.S. training center in Colorado Springs, where we trained a lot, it, 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 I didn't really have any much pushback. I mean, I was an older athlete. I was 38 at the time. So it's not like I was an impressionable 16-year-old. So nobody was really saying, you know, much. My teammates noticed the change, but because a lot of people always ask like, oh my gosh, you must've gotten so much blowback because that was back in the time when athletes could never, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, you're going to absolutely, you know, wither away into nothing if you switch over to plant-based diets. We know so much more now, right? A lot of people have seen the game changers and seen that's completely a myth. But um you know, it was just kind of like I I was rising to the occasion and and riding and racing and lifting more than I ever had before on 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 a meat based diet. And so, you know, I mean, they didn't really care what I was eating. It was like, you know, just keep just keep rocking it. So I was. It was just kind of something I did for those couple of years. And then post Olympics, I just had this. Uh, I knew I was going to retire. I was forty on the podium. I was like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to continue being a professional cyclist. And I knew that I. Um, that my heart was leaning towards becoming an activist. So charted that that journey that's, I guess, I guess a 12-year journey now because it's 2024. <laughs> um, and I ended up starting an organization that I'm now the founder and executive director of um, called Switch for Good. But prior, prior to that, you know, I just really dug into the, some of the animal rights organizations that were around and are still around and just learned a lot, did a lot of leafletting, just did it, just did a lot of, um, you know, volunteering and learning more and, and really realized that if I was going to start something, I wanted to do something very different than what's already out there. Cause we already have quite a few extraordinary animal rights organizations, right? I mean, we've had PETA for 50 years. We have Mercy for Animals. We have, you know, HSUS, you have the Humane League, like they're, they're, and they're all doing kind of the same thing. And so I thought, I'm I'm doing this because I I believe in compassion and the right to life um, for all beings that are on Earth, and so I've got to tell this story in a way that resonates with hopefully all people. Because unfortunately, the the animal rights angle doesn't resonate with everyone, right? It just doesn't, and that that's that just is what it is. So we know that information, and how else? can I help people to make a shift in their diet? Like what are the other levers that we can pull um, to help people make a change? And so, yeah. So Switch for Good was born out of compassion for animals. We all typically claim that we are against cruelty to animals, yet like you right. said, billions of animals are slaughtered each year for food. Do you think, Dotsi, this could be in part due to the lack of knowledge on how to eat plant-based or a cultural norm of how majority of the people eat or simply an unintentional lack of empathy for what is going on behind our plates? What is driving the fact that 80% right. of the population, of the world's population, still consumes meat and dairy right. every day? Yeah, I mean, you've hit on on some of the reasons uh, for sure. Um you know, the roots of our love for certain creatures and our indifference towards so many others stems from cultural conditioning for sure, right? Like we were born and we're, I know I can speak for myself. I just was raised and there was a hamburger that was put on my plate or a piece of chicken or a piece of fish or or, or whatever it might be. And I look down and there's two dogs um, I had rabbits and gerbils. I had so many animals around me. I was at horses. Um, and, and those, uh, 
uh, nobody would have ever had any type of conversation at any point that we would put those animals on our plate. Yet, research shows us uh, time and time again, and I don't even really think the research is all that necessary because if you just spend time with any animal, and you can go to a, a farm animal sanctuary if you want to spend times with time with the animals we eat, like pigs and chickens and turkeys and cows, um, you can see that they have an entire experiential world all of their own entirely. So it, it I mean, it requires a, a moral awakening for sure, right? Like recognizing that they're all the same. Now, if you don't love animals and you really don't care how they're treated, and let's say you don't have any animals at home, right? Like lots of people don't, they don't have a dog, they don't have any animals. Some are scared of animals. You know, that that moral awakening is, is, is gonna be a lot um, tougher. To, to, to have unfold for sure. Um, and, and because, you know, you just don't have that any type of connection at all. But those of us that do have a, a somewhat of a deep connection or, or have, uh, you know, have a pet um, that they cohabitate with and then, you know, can eat a pig that is just as smart as their dog, you know, from a factory farm and slaughterhouse, that's just straight up cognitive dissonance. Um, and that's what I had. I, I just didn't see the connection for a very long time. Why? I never thought of it. I mean, period. I just, you know, and then when I did, for me, it was a like a soul shift. Uh, I just, I just couldn't not then at that point. But people, with a lot of times, I hear from people that it's they feel like eating plant, like to try to eat more plant based. Sometimes for health, sometimes because they stand up for the planet, because they stand up for food equity, right? And 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 we have a we have a very white food system in America that we can go into. And so they you know they want to stand up for for food justice and food equity for all people. There's all sorts of different reasons. But sometimes I'll hear, well, it's it's still hard. You know, I don't really know what to, to pick out at the grocery store, or I don't have the options. Or sometimes I'll hear, and quite a, often I'll hear, um, I don't want it to be weird around my families at holidays. I, when I go out to dinner with the crew at work, I don't want to be the different one. I don't want to be the weird one. Those are really, honestly, the, the very common responses that I get. So that's just lifestyle, right? Just like upending your lifestyle and and. And I don't want to up in my lifestyle. I love my lifestyle, right? And I'm not, I'm not dissing at all. Like, I get it. So there's a, there are a, a lot of roadblocks <laughs> for sure for, for, for people. But um, I think over time, I know over time, I mean, we're not going to be able to sustain killing this many billions of animals for, for too much longer without completely killing our planet. So um, let's, if we fast forward, you know, 30 to 50 years, the norm is going to become eating more plants. And then that, then as the, as society shifts, that starts to become a new norm. And then children born then won't know any different. And then there you go. Right. So it's, it is, it's so familial and it's so cultural. Um, a lot of people have foods that they're, all of us have cultural foods that we eat at, at from our culture at, at certain holidays. And, you know, they don't want to say no to those. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a deep, well of confusion and 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 tough yeah so some of the perspectives that you shared as to why people are hesitant to adopt a plant-based diet are also the perspectives that i get asked often when i am mm -hmm. counseling patients about weight management in my clinic and i'm dealing with pediatric mm -hmm. patients and when i bring mm -hmm. up plant the option of plant-based fuel the two questions that generally come up are so what do we eat then? Only salad? And the question number sure. two is, where do we get the protein from? So right. how would you address these two questions, Dotsy? No, you don't just eat salads. You can eat salads. Salads are good for you. <laughs> we need roughage. <laughs> we need fiber. We, you know, we're, we're getting, I, you know, t the average American is getting 10 to 15 grams of fiber. It's recommended that we have 60 to 80 per day. Um, right. That's where all your good micro microbiota comes from, right? The health of the gut. And you know better than anyone how connected our brain is to our gut yes. and all of the, you know, fairly new evidence that's coming out. Let's say in the last 10 to 15 years, like we didn't have this 25 years ago, this this gut brain connection. So we've seen so much more um uh, mental health issues 
mental illness, right? And it's, it, it's connected, some of it is connected to what we are putting into our mouth. So I think when you, there's a, a, a desire, right? Maybe, maybe some of these people that you're speaking to, like their kid is sick from eating, you know, maybe they have an allergy to dairy or if, if something's going wrong, they've come to see the doc, right? So when you have a purpose behind a change, it's a whole lot easier than just, I'm going to make a random change because why, right? Like life's hard enough. I don't need to now challenge myself to do this thing that, you know, I don't need to do. But when you have a purpose behind it, I think people will find very quickly that um, it's not just salads, right? I mean, you just, you, you, you go to the grocery store, stay on the outer, you know, the outer area is right where the fresh food is. Um, but go down the aisles and get the grains and the legumes, you know, the dried grains and legumes that, that you can cook. It's so easy today with, um, websites and YouTube, and it's easier than ever to just, you know, find recipes. I mean, it, I, pr I literally probably figured out my new plate, um, in, uh, you know, two weeks I had it dialed. It, you just start go, you just start doing going right. And you start to recognize that. You all the macros, right, which are protein, car carbs, and fat, and all the micros, all your really dense nutrient and nutrients and vitamins and minerals are what make up your diet. And those macros and micros can be found in plants, every single one of them. So it's just seeing what you like. There is a lot more plant protein than there is animal protein, as far as the the norm of what people eat, because if most people I talk to, they literally eat the three animals. You know, they eat chicken, turkey, and steak, or chicken, fish, and steak. I mean, you know, no, nobody gives me a list of, of of fifteen animals that they eat. I've never gotten that. I'm sure somebody out there does. But so you're you 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 really look at your diet and you see how, um, you know, you make the same six meals every week. You know, you, you tend to just go habitually into that. You have over twenty easy. You have. This is legumes. You have over over twenty different styles of beans that you can choose from at the grocery store. There's like a hundred and more, but but the common ones. So I think people are always going, oh, but I don't know. Is it going to be bland? Is there going to be flavor? You actually have more options. You actually have more choices. And all of our meat dishes are spiced and marinated with plants. Like it's, it was rare in Kentucky that my dad would throw steaks on a grill that hadn't been like tenderized and marinated and, 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 you know, done with tenderizer salt or all sorts of different herbs and spices. Those are all plants. So you put all of those same nutrient dense plant spices and herbs onto your brown rice bowl with black beans or kidney beans, right? With your tofu scramble on top, with your delicious drizzle of dressing. With oh, your... you're making me hungry, Dotsie. I know, I know. So it's just the shift, right? That 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 it's it's a complete misnomer that there is not delicious, dense protein in the plant world. Like no possible way could I've made it to the Olympic podium if there wasn't protein in my diet, right? I couldn't have grown any muscle and I grew quite a bit of muscle in those last couple of years on a plant-based diet. And that is exactly what I'm facing is there needs to be a dramatic shift in yeah. how people grocery shop, what they are mm -hmm. stocking in their pantry and in their refrigerators and how they are cooking. So for example, currently yeah. I'm taking care of a four-year-old little girl who weighs a hundred pounds. The family does not cook. Oh. When I ask them or guide them about plant-based alternatives or even dairy-based alternatives or healthier alternatives, it requires a certain amount of cooking. So if cooking yeah. is not a part of a family's tradition, it's not a part of their culture, I can imagine the resistance to eating plant-based. Is it, are they going to fast food? Yeah, it's, uh, it's ready to eat, lunchables, um, packaged food, packaged macaroni and cheese, pasta, ready to cook, mm -hmm. microwavable stuff. Right. There is no cooking happening in that household. Right, which is a product of our modern society, right? That's not coming from um, eons old culture. You know, like grandma did not cook that way, right? So yeah, it's tough. 
I, I I was just speaking yesterday with someone. We were just talking about that it's just shifted so intensely in the states anyway, where you could have one income households where you know if if they so choose the, the mother or father could could stay home right because it's it's if you have how many ever kids one three five whatever it is it's a full-time job if you were to cook healthily and nutritionally for the whole family every single day right not just at dinner but making sure that they've got the nutritious food in their lunch but like that is and and you know make sure they're you just have to keep them alive right and that's a hard that's hard work right and and just I, I think I don't have kids, so it's it, it just looks really hard to and it's just overwhelming the it's whole deal. Hard, it's hard, so hard I hear from my friends and my sister, but um, so that's it's like it's it's just sucks that that's it does it. It's not an option. It's two income households, pretty much across the board, and and so then it, you start to deal with the time crunch yeah. and being able to deliver on the table what's nutritious your family versus like what you can just barely get by getting on the table and that sucks and i don't know how to i don't there's so you know there's a lot of economic problems in this country there's, there's a lot of layers to fixing that but it's it's certainly not like it was in what would you say the 50s and 60s where you know some one of the parents could choose to stay home at least for those years before they uh go to first grade or but but now it's like moms are like back at it, it their kids are nine months or something it's it's tough it's tough. It's very tough. Dotsie, how do you feel about the vegan chicken or the the Beyond Burgers or the stem cell modified mm -hmm. vegan food? What are your thoughts on that? Are those healthy? Well, so the 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 vegan stuff that's made from plants. So you mentioned Beyond Burger, it was say Impossible Burger or whatever. Um, as an animal rights activist, I love them because people. There's a you know surveys and research has told us that you know most people. Uh, have no intention of of giving up their cheat night on Saturday night and having a big juicy burger. So to switch it out with yes, something healthier than from a cow. Um, most of the components and ingredients in a Beyond Burger are components of what the cow eats, and then we take the cow and we slaughter the cow, and then we eat the cow, and we could just go directly to the source, which is why plant-based is, is certainly an answer to climate change and, and, and planetary responsibility. So I like it I like it from that angle, but no, that's not something I would feel, uh, just because anything that's processed, and people always say, oh, it's so processed. I'm like, have you been to a slaughterhouse lately? That is a process. <laughs> and you know, if you really actually walked into one and didn't just see a video, no chance in hell anybody that is going to walk out of there and keep eating that. It's, the, the, it, I mean, it, you know, it just, it looks like a fucking murder scene because it is. So that's processed as well. Everything that you eat that's meat has been through quite the process to make it to your plate. So, I, you know, I think that you asked about cell-based cell meat, and I guess I have a similar answer where... <laughs> It, it, it it's not for me because I'm not really interested in eating animals. I, I'm just I, I I've lost the taste entirely. So I think I would I would yak if I if I had if I had that flavor. Um, it's certainly an answer to um, if people are not going to stop right. If, if there's a a large amount of people that are are not going to go plant based and are not going to stop um, eating animals, it is certainly an answer to that. It is a incredible answer for um, climate change mitigating climate change and being uh, responsible um, to our planet. You know, people, I think they think it's, you know, you just mostly we hear like, oh, that's such, that's weird lab grown meat. And again, go to a slaughterhouse. Like that's weird shit. I mean, <laughs> Trump's ones, so if you can take a cell and science can grow that into an actual um, burger or a steak and they, they can, and they have, and I, you know, a lot of people that I know ha have tasted it and it's, you know, it's, it's the real thing. So it tastes like the real thing. Um, they haven't gotten the price down to the price point yet when, where, you know, consumers are, are, are able to, um, you know, they're able to, to serve it, but it's, um, it, 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 it it's certainly not any weirder than what we're doing now. So less than visiting. Animals. Less than visiting slaughterhouses, Dotsie, what do you think it will take 
to shift the perspective of majority of the humankind just for the sake of Mother Earth? Well, uh, I think a, 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 a pretty cast, catastrophic event. You know, I think I think not for all. Like I'm seeing change every day. Like we're 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 front line and center, and people are changing every single day and gladly and excitedly and they're feeling better and more energy and their skin's clearing up. I mean, you know, we were talking about earlier how some of the reasons um, people change are vanity, right? They, 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 you know, maybe they hit the fifties and they get that, you know, they get man boobs or they get the, you know, the, the, the side kind of, you know, fat that comes on that they're not loving. Uh, and a lot of people will make a shifts or change or try something because they're, they're, you know, they're looking for a solution and a lot of times that is a, a fantastic solution, right? Is, is, is changing, changing your diet. So we're seeing people change every day. So I see positivity out there and I'm seeing change and I'm seeing people be excited about change and, you know, sharing it with their friends and their family and their children and everything. Um, but for, you know, for, for some folks that you just don't want to change, you know, we, we could get to a catastrophic event that takes place for the planet where we, you know, recognize, but honestly, I don't know for sure. All of that information is, is ready and available for people to dive into. So I, it, you know, I don't know if, if that alone would, I know that we're going to be in a different place 20 years ago than we are now, because the, the, that the age category that's not changing is the 60 and 70 year olds. So, you know, they won't be here in 20 years. And the, and the and the young folks are on fire to save the planet because they're freaked out, right? I'm not even really freaked out. I'm 51. I'm going to be, I'm going to be out of here before that. <laughs> and I don't have kids, right? So I'm like, later people, you did it to yourselves. Um, it's just not a, a thing, but it's, it's, I, I think we're going to see a dramatic drop in eating animals over the next 20 years, just very simply because the younger generation is. You know, I they're hip to what's going on. That. I can't know. wait for that switch to happen, Dotsie. I can't wait for people to switch for good to plant-based yeah. diet for the sake <laughs> of Mother Earth, for the sake of climate change, to avoid cancer, to avoid mm -hmm. heart disease, for the sake of vanity, for the sake of better skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like pick, pick, whatever you want, whatever you want to pick, pick it because it works, I know. Yeah, I love it. Thank you, Dotsy. Thank you for sharing such valuable insight with us. It was a fantastic conversation. Yeah, it really was. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dotsy. See you next let's, time. See you. Um, let's reconnect with what truly matters. Let's reconnect with the real world. Let's reclaim our time and attention. Let's ungrip devices and grip life. I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.